Hello everyone and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. My name is Sava and today let's talk about something completely different. We all know what options are, what optionality is, how to trade derivatives and even how to value them using the Black-Scholes formula. However, the concepts that we have learned or derived, developed in options trading and options valuation can find truly unexpected applications in many seemingly unrelated areas of finance. Let's start this trade. Let's have a very simple example. Imagine that we have a company, a private equity company or a publicly listed company. It doesn't really matter at that stage. What matters is that you have reasonable access to its books, to its accounts. And imagine that you figured out that the market value of the assets in place, the assets on the company's books is $50 million. And uh, it has funded the purchase of this assets uh, partially by the shareholders or the owner's equity and uh, partially using external financing, uh, i.e. debt. And uh, imagine that the principle of debt that the company has raised is $40 million. And uh, basically the company has attracted $40 million loan. And for simplicity, let's assume that it is a zero coupon debt or a zero coupon bond or whatever. Basically, you just take out a loan, you keep it, you do whatever you want with it, but then you have to repay it um, after a certain period of time at maturity. And let's assume that the maturity of th this debt is five years. And uh, the risk for rate, well, we all know what the risk for rate is and how to calculate it. So imagine at the very day you look through the accounts of this company, you check that the yield to maturity of a relevant US government bond, in that case, it's a five year government bond is 1.5%, for example, which is not uh, that far from the truth. And uh, you also looked at past corporate filings. So you looked at a reasonable number of previous reports that has been filed by the company and you have figured out that the standard deviation of the company's asset growth. So you just kind of plotted market value of assets of this company year on year and you figured out that the standard deviation of this growth rate is, let's assume, for example, 30%. So on average, the growth rate of the company would deviate 30% from the trend. And uh, that might be surprising, but those five inputs are actually enough to undertake a pretty reasonable valuation for company's equity, for company's debt, and uh, even figure out a bunch of valuation multiples and even value corporate default risk. How on earth might one be able to do so much by just using these seemingly easy figures? Well, to understand that, we need to apply the logic of options and optionality and link it to who gets the money when companies go bust and when do companies go bust? Well, we all know that if there is an issue with corporate performance, if a company defaults on its debt or goes bankrupt for any other reason, then the debt holders, so the holders of corporate bonds or creditors, for example, banks, have uh, the first right to claim companies' assets. What it means is that if the company doesn't have enough assets when its debt matures to pay off $40 million to its creditors, then the creditors get pretty much everything the company owns. They liquidate corporate assets altogether and uh, the shareholders are left with nothing. However, if the company performs exceptionally well and uh, the market value of assets that the company holds increases tremendously throughout this five year period, then at the end of the day, the debt holders, bond holders or creditors get their fair due. They get their $40 million back. But everything else, everything in excess of $40 million is reaped by 
company's shareholders. That's the main reason why it's often stressed in corporate finance textbooks that, well, debt is less risky than equity and all of that. But how to actually model it using the logic of options? Well, if you think about it, from the shareholder's perspective, investing into such a company is very similar to holding a call option. If you buy a call option, then if the underlying share price falls below the strike price, then you get nothing and uh, you just fix your loss as the premium for the option that you had to buy. However, if the share price exceeds the strike price, if the option moves out of the money, then you as the holder of the call option are happy as hell because you can buy the underlying at the strike price and sell it at a higher price, which is the market price. The logic is very similar. There is no actual options being traded in that case. But if the market value of assets of the company at the end of the period when it has to repay its debts exceeds the strike price, a quote strike price, the debt principle, then the shareholders are left with something. Well, what is that something? That's just the difference between the market value of assets at that point and the debt principle that it has to repay to its bondholders first as a priority because of the corporate code and so on. However, if the underlying share price, which is the market value of assets at the end of the period collapses below the strike price, which is the principle of the debt, then shareholders are left with nothing. They are not charged extra because of uh, limited liability because you cannot make shareholders liable for anything beyond their initial contribution. And that's where the logic of optionality comes in. So we can value the equity of a company that abides by these rules using the Black-Scholes formula. And that's why we need the risk rate, and that's why we need the volatility, which is, in our case, just the standard deviation of asset growth. And obviously, we need to assume that this volatility will carry forward into the future, that the debt that the company holds is pretty homogeneous and it will be all repaid within a fixed amount of years. And uh, I need to concede here that very few companies actually abide by those rules, but some of the smallest private equity companies or startups actually do. So if you lay your hands on some startup, you can reasonably apply this procedure to come up with a market valuation of its equity pretty accurately. So without further ado, let's apply the Black-Scholes model. And again, just to recap, we need to figure out the upward drift and downward drift, which is the expression of the potential upside, the expression of potential downside, and then figure out the fair value of the call option, which in our case is the market value of equity, using the standard normal distributions applied to the values D1 and D2. So, we need the natural logarithm of the ratio between the center price, which is the market value of assets, and the strike price, which is the debt principle, plus, open brackets, the risk-free rate times volatility squared divided by 2, all of it, times maturity in years, and then we need to divide that by volatility not squared times the square root of the maturity period. We enforce this formula, get 0 0.78, and then we can just copy it across to D2, and here convert this plus into a minus, because that's the representation of the downside. And that is equal to 0 0.11. So to figure out the market value of equity using the logic of the Black-Scholes formula, we just need to plug in those values into the formula. So first we need to multiply the center price, so the market value of assets, times the standard normal distribution of D1, and we need to take it cumulative, minus the strike price, which is the debt principle, times the exponent of minus the risk-free rate times maturity in years times, again, normal standard distribution of D2 cumulative. And we see that the market value of equity is equal to $18.95 million in that case. If we compare it to book value of equity, which is assets minus liabilities, then we'll get 10. So the price to book ratio is above 1. It's 1 
And here we get the really nice logic of the price to book ratio representing both growth potential, which is, again, standard deviation of asset growth, volatility. The higher is the volatility, the greater is the chance that the company will grow tremendously above its current value, but also price to book ratio represents risk. Growth stocks can be called riskier to some extent. Given the fact that we know the market value of equity and the market value of assets, we can figure out the market value of debt as well. If we subtract the market value of equity from the market value of assets, we can see that the market value of debt is slightly above 31 million. And the notional, while the book value of debt, the debt principle, is actually $40 million. So here we can actually figure out what is the yield to maturity of such debt, uh, that is, lend to such a company, and uh, figure out what is the default risk premium for company with such level of risk. So to figure out the yield to maturity, we need to divide the debt principal, which is going to be repaid at the end of the period if the company doesn't go bankrupt, divided by the market value of debt, raise it to the power of one over maturity to bring it back to annual frequency and subtract one. And we see that the yield to maturity of this company's debt is 5.19%. So as we know the risk rate as well, we can figure out that the default risk premium for this company is 3.69% per annum. And the final bit that we can calculate in terms of multiples is two different types of leverage. Leverage that is calculated using book values and leverage that is calculated using market values. So for the book value leverage, we just need to divide the debt principle by the book value of equity. And it's going to be 400%, so 4, which is unsurprising as we have 4 times more debt in terms of book value than equity, and that was kind of intuitive at the start. But for the market value, uh, in terms of debt to equity ratio, we just can divide the market value of debt by the market value of equity and get a much lower value, 1.64%. Uh, it means that uh, the book values that we get for leverage do not necessarily represent the reality accurately. And uh, that is very relevant for something like weighted average cost of capital calculations that is routinely done by corporate managers or investors. So some calculation like it might be even required to figure out appropriate weightings for debt and equity in uh, weighted average cost of capital. Finally, let's just do some comparative statics. Let's assume that the company is actually less levered. Let's assume that its debt is just 30. So it funds its current activities uh, to a greater extent using equity than in the previous example. That would give us the fact that the price to book ratio will drop to 1.24 from uh, almost 2, which means that the company is less risky, ultimately, and its default risk premium will also drop significantly, which is something that we would expect in such a scenario. Alternatively, let's see what would happen if the standard deviation of asset growth, so our volatility, in terms of the Black-Scholes model, will increase to something like 50%. We can see that both the price-to-book ratio and default risk premium skyrocket. And um, actually, interestingly, what happens to leverage is that actual leverage, if you measure it using market values, plummets below 1, regardless of the fact that actual book value leverage stands at 400% still. This model is very useful in terms of expanding the logic of optionality into debt and equity valuation. It is important to trace the relationships between various related concepts, such as price to book ratio, default risk premium, leverage in book values or market values. And uh, most usefully, it actually allows you to reasonably accurately value a startup that reports nothing 
but it's assets that and uh, has a little bit of filings down the line so you can figure out its asset growth volatility and that's all there is for the black shoals model in its unintuitive and unexpected applications please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful in the comments below please let me know what other videos in business economics or finance you would like me to make and please don't forget to subscribe to our channel thank you very much and stay tuned